This is an oral history interview for the Echoes of the Decade project for the Culture Division of Donegal County Council. Today is the 27th of November 2020. My name is Regina Fitzpatrick and today I'm speaking with Jimmy McGill and this is our third uh, recording. Um, Still over the phone, Jimmy, as uh, we have our COVID-19 restrictions are still in place. And um, yeah, we finished up the last day, um, Jimmy, uh, you were talking about when you were working in England in the 1950s, working um, on building sites in or around London and what it was like living over in England at that time. Um, So we might maybe pick up at that point and start talking about that um, to start off with today. He was bored us in it, and he was the name of Wallace from Letterkenny. Mm-hmm. And his wife was, she was Welsh. And I tell you, there were, it was a five story building, and there were 18 Irish in it. My gosh. Stopping and there were two, there were two from Donegal that I knew that they were in it. But there were three in every room. It was a five story building, and there, there were a white bucket inside the door. <laughs> That's what they talked. Well, it was, oh but uh, the, that, that uh, I don't know, was that Wallace there from Latakenny? And I hear some of them on the local radio there in that time, but uh, they, were, they would be very older fellas still, like most of them. There were some great characters in it. And you were telling me, um, sorry, that the recorder just had a problem there for a minute. You were telling me the names of the dance halls, um, Jimmy, uh, what were the you were you mentioned the one in Hammersmith? What was that one called again? Uh, that's the Gary Owen. The Gary and then Owen. there were another another one opened in Hammersmith, the New Emerald. It was close to Hammersmith, and the one you got the the Shamrock, where the Buffalo was in Camden Town. That's the first dance hall I went to. And there were there were always a row at the end of the dances in the Irish dance hall. Really. Nearly always there'd be a row out after the dance on the street and the women would get involved too in it. And then the the Black Mariah came round and that's <laughs> they called it Paddy's Taxi. And and take them in and they would be up the following morning for disturbing the peace and stuff. <laughs> but that happened regular at at, at the Irish dance halls. My God. <laughs> and but what was women, Yeah. The women, the women was out and had them stiletto heels on them at the time. And if you got a knock on one of them, they would feel it. They were fighting <laughs> along, along with the men. It was funny times. And, and you were saying that most of the people that you came across working on the building sites were, there was Donegal people, people from Mayo, Connemara. Uh, and Kerry, most lot, and Anne Claire. There was a cattle pull of Claire, he worked along with us, but he stopped the routing house, they called it outside of Camden Town. I kind of a cheap place for you. It was lying all, all over the place, but was, the, the digs was for nearly nothing. And this cattle pull, and he, got, he was a very fine looking man, McCall, and he. He worked along with us for a while. And the, we used to get in the bus from London the way out to Woodish. Going back, he would tell the conductor to leave me up outside the routing house in Camden Town. But <laughs> he, and he wouldn't. He wasn't. Uh, he wouldn't drink or smoke. But he was all a, a heck into the horses and dogs betting. But I don't know what happened in front. <laughs> And was um, you were saying that Irish people kind of would have would have stuck together, like they worked together, they found digs together, they went to dances uh, together. The, uh, I do. Did in most cases now that 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 was uh, kind of the rule with them right, right now, that they would know that to be whatever digs they'd be in, there'd be some more locals. In most cases, there would be not always, but most cases there were. Only time at Christmas then. I spent two, two or three Christmases there, I think. And there were, these people disappeared. They had people somewhere else. And I was on my own there in the, in the, ba- the basement flat. And 
I used to make Christmas dinner, a couple of, a, a loaf of bread and a tin of beans. And that would be it for Christmas. But uh, we paid no heed to it, which was a going thing. Our birthday, 21st birthday, or no word of it. Gosh. There were very hard times on young Irish people going over. It was, it was, it was tough, Jimmy. Uh, the most thing that was fair and embarrassing for them was uh, people that had no English hardly. But I had English, but uh, there were a lot of the ones with Connemara now especially. Uh, we used to talk with the Irish on the bus there among ourselves. And I'm sure the, the, the passengers didn't like it a bit. <laughs> really? Because I didn't know. They didn't know what we were talking about. But uh, the, that's what finished the Irish here. They came back then and there were three other Irish. What good is the Irish? They don't want to do it in England. It's embarrassing to be uh, talking Irish in England. And that kind of harmed the Irish a lot to you, I think. Uh, my doubt it was no good when you had to go away anyway. But both times changed since. Now they're trying to get it back again, but I don't think it'll ever really come back here. Mm. And I, I'm wondering, I suppose, um, a lot of the people who went to England at that time, um, you know, we're only talking, I suppose, 30, um, 30 to 40 years after independence. Um, uh, and what would people, I suppose, when they moved to England, was that a when they were there, was there a very strong sense of Irish identity? Were people political in any way or, you know, how I suppose there'd been a in Ireland, I suppose there'd been an, an anti-English kind of a sentiment, you know, because of uh, everything and how. You know, how how was that for people when they went over then to England? How did they, or how did you feel about it and people around you feel about it? Well, I didn't, but I knew, I knew like there ought to leave to people from Cork too. You met them, I mean, it was embarrassing for them. I met the Henry, he was Henry Collins, a big man in Cork. He was along with he worked on the boy with me. And he was going to a cafe to order a meal or a water or something. And we used to stand back to because we, I mean it wasn't right, <laughs> to, but if they, they couldn't understand one anywhere anything he would say anyway, he kind of broken English or, but mm. with a Cork accent, they couldn't understand. And he, <laughs> he used to get into a wild state of it, <laughs> but there were no we had no mercy for them. <laughs> God. <laughs> And would there have been a lot of women going over at that time as well to be nurses? The NHS, I think, was founded around that time. Was there? No. Uh, there were a lot of them, even the ones that there were landlady. I had there for a while in London. Uh, she was from Neo. She was a nurse. And uh, there were a lot, a lot of ones went, uh, other ones, I knew other girls went, went into nursing over there. Right. And, uh, some of them came back, I think, here to this country again, but uh, a lot of them, some of them went to America, I think, one time you were there. Yeah. And, and you were there, you were saying it was throughout the 50s, really, when you were there, 1957 was the last, your last kind of trip over. Uh, 50, uh, I think 57, 58, I think it might have been there, a couple, mm. uh, until 58, but it was with February 58, I think, so that I can came back because uh, it was because my sister went to America that in 1958 and I was up to Dublin with her to the American Embassy and then went over to Shannon. That's the time I saw my way back to Castle Bar uh, where the <clears throat> Omanis were living. My daughter, she was going on the same plane too, to Philadelphia or New York and uh, they, t- they took me back to Castle Bar and Planes all went out from Shannon that time at two o'clock at night. I was, I was summoned then, but I, I was very lucky. Got, got the next day, uh, I stayed in Castle Bar. I landed in Castle Bar about five o'clock in the morning. And, well, nobody I stayed about the street the end till, uh, till nine o'clock or so when the place was opened up. And I got a bus then to Donegal. My God. Yeah. But, uh, I, you meet a lot of nice people when you're there, I mean, uh, when, you're, when you're away. Yeah. 
How, how dependent, Jimmy, I suppose, again, we're thinking about the 1950s and what Ireland was like. Uh, how dependent were people on the money that emigrants were sending home? And... Uh, the, I don't know that was going on constant. I didn't know sending money home. <clears throat> I don't, don't have my assessment team. But uh, uh, there were a lot to that. And uh, once went to America, the, there was a bigger thing over there. They sent money home too. Anyone got over to America. But uh, that was a usual thing that time. He, because the pay, after our parents there at home, they wouldn't be getting uh, getting no income. They may be a wee bit of farming, but the farming around here wouldn't keep you living anyway at the time. And uh, the, that, that sending money home was a regular thing. Mm. And so when you got back then in 1958, what did you do when you came back? Uh, I went to weave here, so I think about that's the years I started the weaving again. That was when you started the weaving. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, weaving for McGee's at Donegal. Yes. There were a, a table, they had a lot employed here at that, 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 them years, and the way up into the 70s. Uh, they, were, they were very good companies. They're still going at Donegal, but I don't know what they're doing much now or not. Yeah, yeah. And in, I suppose, in around the, the 60s and then the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s, then the the troubles in Northern Ireland, um, I suppose, started around that time. Uh, it was going that time. It was, uh, and they were, uh, it was going that time. And everybody, anyone that was working around here from from England, especially, and there were some of them working in places here that were... I was thinking there were maybe British agents <laughs> that were looking to see with an IRA. Like, there were a couple of them working around here, and, and there were people kind of afraid that they might be informers or something. And that, that went on a bit, but settled, <laughs> settled in eventually. Now, would, it, would, it, would there have been a lot of tension around, I suppose, when the trouble started first and you know, I suppose around the time of kind of major atrocities in in the north. Well, there the was the were there that time, and the were here in Detour. Well, I mean, there were people were still around in these areas that had been involved in the IRA, and the, the, the were the were that's why they would say there were employers about surely, mm-hmm. and anywhere there were people working, especially they would try to get into working it and. And uh, you know, the people were afraid of that, as them, them kind of people. Yeah. And would would you have had cause to cross the border very often, I suppose, in those years? No, I never did. The only time I crossed the border was when I was going to England. Or that's, uh, I would never, never want to cross the border. Right, right. You just stay, stay away but, from it, yeah. You know, stayed away from it because I don't know that they come in so much into into Donegal. I mean, there's full time more in Bushy, and that's why the thing's so bad here. Mm. That uh, I mean, there no no regulations at all at the border. I would think they can, probably can't do it because there's someone them working in the north and some working from the north and the south. And yes, there's some of them have property on both sides of the border. Yes, yeah. Would so people, I suppose, in that part you were saying would have been very sympathetic to this. There would have been some people in the IRA, people were sympathetic to the sort of Republican cause, and uh, uh, there would be, uh, there would be he and Donegal anyway, there were because mm-hmm. on account of the connection to had you and the trouble with people from Derry, especially, and they came in here, they were uh, work, fighting on here with the IRA during the trouble, and then there were no mercy shown to them at all when Donegal was the rest of the country wouldn't treat it the same way as Donegal would. Mm-hmm. The county that being part of Ulster, especially. See the three counties were were, were left out. And that's in the count of the the big Protestant population in Donegal and probably Monaghan and Cavan. And it was done on a head count. Craig was the man in charge in the north that time. He he wanted to make sure that he had a majority. 
in the north. So if he took Donegal and to it in Cavan, he would have no majority then. There would be a Catholic majority in the north. Yes. So so that's why Donegal and them were left out of it. Yes. And as in, in as you understand it, I suppose, having, you know, your father having been involved and yeah. some of the stories you would have heard, I suppose when the treaty was signed, um, like how how big an issue was like was partition the biggest issue, or was oh, there was, bigger it, issues? It was, it was a very big. It was very better here that time. Yeah, but no doubt that Collins just he wasn't near the border, make it, but that might be the reasons Collins done it. But so no doubt that he made a wild blunder that signed that that time. Of course, other people have different opinions about that. I don't know, but the. Uh, it was better here, surely. There was no fighting, but I mean, there was, all you had here then was between Nepal and Fungia. I mean, you could count uh, uh, at election time, you knew every house that was Fungia, you knew every house that was between Nepal. There was no Labour candidates running here, right, any time. It was just the two parties. And that kept going for a long time, but now, in later years, I see now people, younger people, Change they, they can go vote anyway, either way or, or might not vote for any of them. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's what's going on now. I mean, it's completely different now. It's changed altogether. And would you, would you ha- would your father have gotten involved in canvassing for for either party? Well, he would be a terrible, a great wild well, was all for the fall. How you could <laughs> you could put him there up with your mouth about that. And the other person in this house for years. Really? But oh, it was all de Valero with him. And uh, then there were a mixture around me. So my, my girls were divided. But anyone that was an AOH, the ancient order, they, they all were for, went punker side. But they didn't take any part in the troubles. So to, you know, and I didn't, they didn't do any of the fighting to anyone as an Hibernian. Ancient order of my bunyan. Yes, yes. Like a religious group. But uh, they didn't, uh, they took, uh, they generally, the mall, I would say, took the, uh, the Pungale side. Right. And would there have been, would there have been uh, a lot of tension around elections, say, no, up through the years? <laughs> would you have any no, stories I, about that? No, the elections were there. Oh, you had the men out there. Anyone that's for Pina Paul would get a free car, somebody would drive for them and go around all the houses. And Fungale was the same. But they would get them all out of the put a move at all, they would get them out to vote. But uh, no, that. Uh, although then, well, during the, between the elections, so it didn't make any difference at all. <laughs> you know, just worked together and done nothing. I was going to ask that because you were saying that there were very bitter divisions after the Civil War locally, like families were divided and and that sort of thing. Well, there were the families. The families were even to be a new different families here. Some of them were, went both sides. Some of them took the side of the treaty and some took the opposite side. Oh, that that was a common thing here, right? No, mm. that was a line of families. And how did I suppose? In the years after the Civil War, um, how did people come back together? Were there, you know, how quickly did people come back together? Or was it was it that they came back together fairly quickly, but you could just see the divisions around election times and things like that? Uh, the, 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 once election was over, that it was gone. They, no, they worked away then. They were normally, they were, didn't meet, mean you when you'd meet them and mixed away. They didn't really keep it up. Mm. It was only just uh, it heated up at election time for a while, a lot of days. But uh, the, after that, it was back to normal. Yes, but that, yeah. that's gone. That's gone completely now. I don't know. Yes. It's, well, uh, they're in coalition now, aren't they? Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, they are. They no got the three teachers are now, but they know they have no much. They none of them as much face in any government that's going on anymore. They don't. They don't seem to like them as no what they Yes, yes. Uh, anyway, they make out they're getting on. I agree with that, that they're getting far overpaid and 
there should be about 40,000 cut-offs of salaries and the, that other house, the Shannon, that should be cut out long ago. There's no need at all for a Shannon because there's no power of anything. There's only a dumping, dumping ground for TDs that lost their seat. And uh, uh, I would be deaths against that. What year did your father pass away? He died in 1968. So he saw a good, you know, he saw a good sort of almost 40 years, more than 40 uh, years of, of the new state that he sort of helped to fight for. Uh, how do you think he felt about his involvement and how things well, turned no, he, out? He would never, he would never say much. He would never say much to us. I knew we when we were growing up about, about the troubles or about, the time that afterwards he wouldn't. He, I used to go to meetings, but we wouldn't be going to meetings at all. He would, he, he went to attend all these Queen of All meetings anyway. Mm-hmm. And uh, I suppose he was going all right. The pension, a lot of them I arrived, they got, got, to, got to very small pension at some stage. It was only, I think he was getting £16 a year now. Of some kind of pension when I arrived up on the Northern Witch. Yes, but yeah, anyone, the military that, anyone that jo- any, uh, The ones that joined, some of them joined, a lot of them joined the army, the Irish army after the, the time of the black up. And uh, as they spent a lot of years in the army, they got a far bigger pension. Right. Uh, there were neighbours here now that were then joined when the, 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 the Free State Army. And uh, they got a, they, when they were, I don't know when they left it, but they they got a they got seemed to they got a lot bigger pension. And did your father enlist in the National Army for a time, or or was he nah. was your father in the the National Army for a while, or he was in a very short time because he left it in account of the trouble that the army was rounding up these, and then the the British were supplying them with arms. To fight the IRA, what was left to the IRA, and that's why he, he didn't spend no long, long in the army. He left to join, he got no army pension. And he left because you know he didn't uh, agree with that, and he was. You no, know, there was some of that, there was some of them shot the, the, the Asia army shot some of them down about the big time down about Drumbo. Yes. There were a couple in Northern Ireland, people, uh, Sean Larkin, he was shot there by the Free State Army. He was one of the leaders here from Derry. But to worry about it, bitterness about that, terrible bitterness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it, there was a lot, of, was there a lot of people from the anti-treaty side, I suppose, um, in Donegal at the time of the Civil War that weren't from Donegal? Uh, uh, there were. There were a lot from the north, especially because the time the fighting was going on here, they came into Donegal to fight because the most they couldn't get going in the north fight. And uh, there were a lot, a lot came in here into Donegal. There were some of the most of the headmen were from Northern Ireland and here. They were from Derry, most of them. And it was, uh, you know, it was a, a really a tough time, I suppose, on people like your father, who I suppose were, you know, had fought in the War of Independence and then you know, the government took a, another direction then, you know, or the government that was founded was, was not what he agreed well, with. Well, it was very bitter that time. I mean, the government that went in, I think, about 1922, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that was a real disaster for them here. But and, and down the country to Cork, especially, even Michael Collins. I mean, they were very bitter about what he'd done because he knew all these IRA men because he was in charge and he was a great fighter. But he, he knew where they were, he knew where, because he was in charge of them up there. So he, ran, he had no trouble rounding up a lot of them there, the anti-treaty crowd. And uh, although he got the, he got killed himself to an end, but, uh, and Higgins. Yes. Higgins was another fellow that, that, that was in a bad book here. He actually executed his own best man. He was his best man from the old, and uh, he was t- he's taken up to the pre state army part of and he was executed. But Kevin O'Higgins was killed after that, I think. 
And would would your father have ever, I suppose he died, you know, before the conflict got very bad or took off in Northern Ireland. Would mm. would he have ever talked about his views on, on the North? No, he never, not to us. To him, sure there were plenty. He never spoke about that or he never spoke about his brothers that was killed in the First World War. Yeah, yeah. I think that that was two things he now not not to us anyway. We know well was our fault. Well, we never asked him any questions much. <clears throat> no, no, but up until since probably would because well, we, what happened? We went away too. We were away most yeah, of, yeah, 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 and uh, that didn't. There were no no talking done about it. And when his when he died, would there have been a mention of his involvement? in the War of Independence at his funeral? Oh, there were 20, I remember there were generals, but uh, the local defence forces, they had a thing down in the graveyard there, they got, were gun salute, <laughs> okay. or whatever, in the graveyard the time you were buried, all right. Yeah, yeah. And what what do you, I suppose, how do you feel about at the moment, we're kind of in this decade of commemorations, commemorating everything that happened from 1912 to 1923. Um, what what do you think is the legacy of that period? What would you say the legacy is locally and in, in your family of that period? Well, the legacy is, has got the only thing that probably bothers that there's no such thing as a free state. <laughs> A free island after all the troubles and after all that went on, I'm sure it's, it's overall. But I think they went the wrong. I think they went took the wrong way way about in the north. I think if they had to work together, but I tried to work together with the Protestants in the north all along. It might have worked out different, but I mean it was very better there in the north, and still well, it's not too bad now, but. Uh, still a bit there, but uh, I think they went the wrong way about it there in the north. Yes, yeah, yeah. And do you, how do you feel about your father's? Do you feel a sense of pride or how do you feel about your father's involvement? Well, it, I think, I think mostly, some, most of the men that got involved here probably haven't told you since it's the time his brother was killed in the first 1916 and uh, the psalm, I think that, I mean, we're kind of more ashamed of being work, and then people have been work, uh, fighting for Britain. That was very, that was, a, a, and that's why that uh, some of them maybe went the other way here to make up for it one way or the other, I don't know. But uh, yeah. there were no, there were no, any of them that was, I uh, knew a good few of them that, that was killed in the first world world war from round here, and uh, uh, the, they were never mentioned. And they're still now this last while they are now commemorating them, and I came back, but uh, they, they weren't. I mean, they thought it's the last thing a person should do is go, go join and fight for Britain. <laughs> At the time, it was a big sin not to do that. Yeah, yeah. And how how do you think how do you think Donegal has fared in the last hundred years as part of a I suppose a a free state and then a republic? How do you think Donegal has fared out of all of it being so close to the border and everything? No, the Donegal still mixed up a bird here. I would think they still think some of the most of them still think they are. We'll get it. We could do a rule of border, but I mean, that's right. And that's the way we do it in peaceful means. They're not going to do it through any kind of war or when again, anyway. That's, that's right, I would think. Mm. Mm. And and would you feel, I suppose, that how, how do you think economically Donegal has fared? Well, well, they, they, well, normally, I suppose, uh, we were probably more dependent on Britain to, uh, for uh, for export. And, and I was writing up the ages for thousands of them, more down to get work and, and 
we are still against England, by the way. It's, 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 uh, that's the way it is. It. You, can't have, you can't have it the two ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm wondering, I suppose, you mentioned your grandchildren earlier on. Um, you know, you know, you've seen a huge amount of change in your lifetime. And they're, I suppose, growing up in a kind of a different Ireland, aren't they? No, uh, they are. They are it's completely different for them now. Uh, they're trying to take the age by a bracket school now. They can't talk Irish in bracket school enough. Up till they got to first class, the infants can't talk no. no. That started lately now in, in Brocky, you know. They're trying to take back the eyes that way, but I don't think that'll work either. Yeah. And would you speak well, Irish to your grandchildren or? No, uh, no, I do sometimes, but then they don't have it because their father and mother doesn't talk to them in age. And... Well, they have some of them, I'd be taking. <laughs> Yeah, to my not time, but they don't be about the house now much. Oh, that's good quite. But oh, they do. But once they've gone to post class then they'll go to comprehensive school after that. That's the time it dies out. Although anyone that wants to get any kind of a job or civil service or or anything you get or teaching, they have to learn the age anyway, but they learn it when they get older but Yes. Yes. But the age is, uh, I mean, people are not making age in the houses here anymore. Hardly any house that I know of around here that makes age to their children. And that would be a big change from when you were growing up? It was a terrible change from the time I was small. <laughs> it was all age around here. Everybody. The properties, I think it was the properties that changed it here. And there were terrible immigration in the fifties, and uh, I think that kind of punished, really punished the Irish. Now I don't think it'll really come back. I mean, they're all they're all the time on about the power of them and us and about uh, I well the champagne crowd in the north and all. So I have plenty of Irish in the north because they learned it. I think on account of the troubles, they wanted to make a point to have an Irish in, in the north. I think. Mhm. Right. And do you what what would you say if you had to kind of name some of the biggest changes you've seen in your lifetime? I mean we we mentioned I suppose the the kind of decline of Irish and what other things would stand out for you as the biggest developments or changes in your lifetime? Uh, well there's, there's more more employment anyway most cases there's employment things here but that's the employment thing here changed way back, I think, in a bit. It changed a lot since we joined the EU. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, tra- cattle trade and sheep trade are like mended too because they're getting subsidies and stuff like that. But, uh, the, the markets for the farmer that uh, been in the EU helped a lot. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that was a big, a big change, yeah. Yeah, Jimmy, I'm conscious that I've kept you a long time. I'm, is there anything okay. else that I could that you you'd like to no. talk about, or that I we haven't covered no. that you think no, is important okay, to say? Thank you. You can ring you any time away later on. Maybe we might meet sometime. I I'd love that. Years. I'd I'm love it. Years up. <laughs> Jimmy, it was such a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so All much right. for everything. Uh, thank you, Ted. Thanks a lot.